we are all here today because we are learning about elevator pitches as well as how to tactfully follow up. Looking at the answers in the chat function, many of you were saying that, yeah, elevator pitches might have helped me. No, it hasn't really helped me. Or yes, it has gotten me that next job. Wherever you are right now or how comfortable you feel with elevator pitches, I bet at the end of today, you are all going to walk away with those tactical skills on how to think about. Them. So what you should see here on your screen is going to be the text. And I want to share with you what I'm going to be talking about specifically today. And trust me, our time is going to go by really fast. And there's so much I'm going to be sharing with you. But just to start, I'm going to kick off our talk today by talking about some misconceptions. Misconceptions about elevator pitches. As I mentioned, it doesn't just happen in an elevator, perhaps maybe 20, 30 years ago. But now elevator pitches mean something completely different. And understanding what it means now is how you can start to tailor it. We're also going to be talking about the power of it. Because, you know, sometimes I feel like elevator pitches, it doesn't, it doesn't have a good rap. It's kind of like, but is it just like me talking about myself? Is it just me trying to sell myself? Well, it's actually a little bit more strategic than that. I'm going to talk about the power of it. Then I'm going to share with you what I consider this winning formula of what to say and how to say it so that when you do talk about yourself, people are like, what? They want to know more. I'm also going to be then sharing my, my favorite tips on following up, following up with tact. Because for many of us, women, men, wherever you are, it can sometimes feel... I guess, uncomfortable, right? Following up. Am I doing it too much? Am I bothering people? But there is an art to it and I will be talking about it. My hope is at the end of my 40, 45 minute chat, everybody here is gonna walk away feeling like they have a clear strategy of what to say and how to say it. And most importantly, you will all walk away feeling more confident and knowing how to practice this in your work later today, tomorrow, this week, and just remembering to do these things. So before we kick start into the content, I want to do a quick intro of who I am and why am I talking about elevator pitches now? I started off my career on TV. I was a former television journalist all around the country here in the U.S. I was in New York for a few years. My last stop was at the ABC station in San Diego, California, which was actually where I won my Emmy Award. And it's funny because after I won that Emmy Award, a lot of people were like, what's next? Like, you know, where do you wanna go? Like you, you have this prestigious award. And it was funny because after I won that award, I was actually like, I wanna actually leave television. I wanna leave television because there's so many things I learned talking on TV, public speaking, interpersonal communications that you learn as a journalist, that I was like, wait a second, I can actually teach this to ambitious professionals so they can sharpen this very important skill of communications. I started Soulcast Media about four years ago, and it has been such an honor. I've taught over 2 million people now how to become more of that confident speaker, I've spoken at Google, Microsoft, the United Nations, all these like really big companies to inspire folks to think about communications a little bit differently. Why do I say this though? I say this because communications for me, it was not something I was good at to tell you the truth. Part of it is personality. I consider myself a little bit more introverted and shy and timid. And so if you can imagine, you know, when you go out into the working world, you suddenly realize wait a second, you do have to be very outspoken. You do have to be quite extroverted in order to get your ideas heard. And I always say, you know, I started out my career on TV, which was the best training grounds, because I always like to share wherever you feel like you are right now in your communications, whether you're like, I love presentations or I hate doing presentations, it's always something that can be improved. And, you know, I'm living proof of that personality-wise, and even culturally, right? There's a lot of things that I had to learn, but I'm here to say it's absolutely possible. And actually, two weeks ago, 
LinkedIn awarded me a top voice for presentation skills. Part of it's probably because they, they see that I love talking about it and I love teaching. So I'm just really honored to be here with you all today because we're going to be talking about communications and how you can level up your elevator pitches and most importantly, how you can approach this. So let's first talk about pitches, the power of your elevator pitch. Now, like I said, sometimes we think about elevator pitches and we're like, how do we do it? Is it really like, you know, us only doing it when we meet someone for the first time? The answer is no. The power of the pitch is actually powerful because of a few things. And you'll see it here on your screen. The power of your pitch and doing it well is it actually will help you build curiosity. This means depending on how you talk about yourself, the idea is you want other people to go, wow, that sounds really interesting. Let me know more. It builds that curiosity if you can frame your pitch right. If you can create a powerful pitch, it creates a strong impression where when people hear your name, they're like, oh yeah, Jessica, yeah, she, she loves talking about communications and she's really good at it, right? It creates that strong impression, but again, it's how you do it. A great elevator pitch also is able to talk about why what you know, the things you do, why is it relevant to the people you're talking to? A good elevator pitch is one that also leverages people's emotions. Now, in a good way though, because you're getting people to feel excited. You're getting people to be curious. You're, you're building that intrigue where people are like, wow, right? It's that wow emotion. Finally, a great elevator pitch and doing it well and consistently establishes connections because we all know when it comes to work, it's not necessarily how hard you work or how much you know, it's really about the people you know who can pull you up along the way. It's your connections. So really, when you think about the power of the pitch, I want you to think about this. Creating your elevator pitch is how you can build credibility it's also how you can hook people in. So again, when they hear your name, they go, oh yeah, I remember Jessica or Stephanie or Stacy, right? These are positive impressions you're creating with people so they remember you. But before we even talk about what goes into this pitch, let's talk about some misconceptions. And these misconceptions are very important to talk about because it'll, it'll align us on what is what good and what is something that maybe we shouldn't include? So what are some misconceptions? You'll see it here. A common misconception is that the more you say, the better your elevator pitch will be. Let me tell you, an elevator pitch is not the time to cram in your resume and all the many things you have done. An elevator pitch is your opportunity to be strategic. So the more info is not necessarily the better. By the way, I want to say, as I'm going through this, including everything else I'm going to be talking about, feel free to take down notes as I'm going through this, or you can put in any comments or questions because I will leave a few minutes at the end to answer any questions you have because we're here together today and I want to make sure that I'm going to be able to answer anything that pops into your mind. And by the way, if you have that question, I encourage you to just kind of write it in so you don't forget. So again, misconception number one is more information, the better. Another misconception is when you say too little. Sometimes when we get nervous, because now it's like, oh, now we have to talk about ourselves. We may rush through it because we're like, we don't like talking about ourselves, so we don't want to say too much because maybe we're afraid of being perhaps off-putting. But saying too little is also not very good. A misconception is thinking it's your time to talk about all the places you've worked, the experiences that you've had, basically what people can see on your LinkedIn page or what's on your resume. Yes, it's true. You can sprinkle a little bit of that, but it's not where you really talk about that whole thing. 
Another misconception is this. It's your opportunity to sell a product, sell a service. This opportunity that you have where you're standing in front of somebody and you're trying to make an impression with them, you're not trying to sell them. You're trying to make sure you say something good enough, which I'm going to tell you what that is, so that they want to continue the conversation with you. Here's the final misconception. It happens alone. So this is something that is kind of like, what, what does that mean? When we think about our elevator pitch, we're thinking about the impression we're making on other people. In fact, we can think about building our credibility by having somebody also talk about us, maybe even when we're not in the room. And this is what I mean by it doesn't always happen alone. You know, when you think about how you're introduced by somebody, remember, like if you think about you're in a meeting, right? And somebody's like, oh, let me introduce you to Jessica. How they introduce you is part of your elevator pitch, whether or not we think about it. In the end though, talking about these misconceptions, I want you to look at this and think, okay, I need to reframe any of the misconceptions that I might have. Perhaps one, two, or maybe all of these actually like really resonate with you because you're like, oh yeah, I definitely see myself, you know, gravitating towards believing any one of these things. But let me tell you right now, this is not how we should think and approach elevator pitches. So then the question is, well, what goes into an elevator pitch? What do I need to say and how do I need to say it? So I wanna be crystal clear with this. When you think of your elevator pitch, it's about the impression that you make on other people. It is your opportunity to say, I need to show my competence. I need to take this opportunity to build trust with the person. I need to make sure I'm saying things so that I'm relatable, but I don't wanna to say too much, just enough, so that the conversation continues. Because remember, the art of a good elevator pitch is people want to know more. You can effectively know that your elevator pitch might not be the strongest when there's no follow-up questions. The mark of a great elevator pitch is where they're like, oh, wow, what did you say about this? Or what did you do when you, when you talked about that, right? It's getting people to engage with you because then that is where you can then continue to talk about who you are and the work that you do. So with that, the question is, what do I need to say? And this is now where I'm gonna get very tactical because I'm gonna be sharing with you the formula. The formula of what goes into your elevator pitch. Now, before I dive into this, I want to say take down notes as I'm going through this formula because this formula is something that as I'm going through this or you know, once we're done with this webinar, you can go back and you can reflect on this and you can figure out how does this apply to me and the different situations that I am in. By the way, if you're like I just want to pay attention, that's great because Jenny and at the end of this, we're going to be emailing you also a PDF of all the things I'm gonna be covering. So that's also another way for you to remember all the material I'm gonna be sharing with you. All right, the formula. What's the formula? So you know how I mentioned that I started out on TV? Every single day, we were pretty much practicing our elevator pitch. We were meeting new people every single day because our day was always different, different stories, different people, that we had to get really good at honing our own elevator pitch. So this formula I'm about to share with you is what I actually call like the TV formula. And it's been tried, true, practiced, and even honed so that I know what, what you're about to see here it's something that absolutely works. So what goes into this TV structure? That's basically what I call it. It's actually four things. Let's start with number one. How you start off your elevator pitch needs to begin with what we call a teaser. After the teaser, you then go into what we call your headline. After your headline, we go into 
your body. And then finally, your last closing point is what we call your takeaway. This is it. This is the formula of how you want to structure your elevator pitch when you meet somebody. What does this mean though? So your teaser, and as you think about this, as I'm walking you through this, I want you to think when it comes to your teaser, I want you to prioritize the first few words you say. Your objective is to evoke some sort of emotion in the person you're talking to. Positive emotions, remember? Things like curiosity, intrigue. Your first few words, maybe even a few first few sentences is where you have that teaser because this is where you hook your audience in. It is much harder to hook your audience in in the middle of your speaking versus the beginning. If you cannot hook your audience in in the first few seconds, it's much harder for them to feel engaged with what you're saying. Your headline then is then thinking about, okay, I've hooked them in with my teaser. Now I need to talk about this headline. What is one or two high level accomplishments I can, I can drop right here so that they go, oh yeah, I, you have a lot of credibility. This is your headline. After your headline, this is where we go into your body. So your body is basically whatever teaser or headline that you said, this is where you back it up. This is where you prove that you really know what you're talking about with maybe some data or some examples. And then finally, your takeaway is where and how you end it so people want to know more. I'm going to dive into each of these four in just a little bit, but I want you to look at this right now because this is basically the formula. This is how I want you to think about structuring your elevator pitch anytime you are meeting somebody for the first time. I mean, especially if you're meeting someone for the first time, but even more so this elevator pitch, it doesn't just happen with new people. You can continuously talk about your elevator pitch in meetings where you're meeting with same people, the people you typically meet, potential clients or any of that, any of this, because every time you speak, it's actually like this too. You have to think about your teaser, your headline, your body, and your takeaway. Okay. This is the most important. You don't want to talk for too long because how many times have we been in conversations where the person has been talking for two minutes? three minutes, four minutes, and they just keep going on and on and on. How much of that, A, do you even internalize all the information that they're saying? And how easy is it for you to also tune out if they talk for too long? This is where I actually want to talk about the traffic light rule really quickly, because this is a very, it's actually kind of a fun thing to look at because it actually crystallizes what this means. The traffic light rule is just kind of like a fun rule of thumb of helping you think about, have I been talking for too long now? Is it time to wrap it up? So I want you to think about it as like this, you know, a traffic light, a, a green, yellow, and red. So I want you to think about the first 20 seconds. This is when you have somebody's attention. They're paying attention. They're interested in listening to you. This is where you can actually say that catchy and relevant word, few sentences to, again, capture their attention. This is actually, we say about like, you know, the first 20 seconds. Now, when it comes to the next 20 seconds, so effectively about 40 seconds into your talking, the other person's kind of thinking, okay, is what Jessica is saying relevant to me? Is it, or is it not? This is where you have this really important chance to continue to retain their attention or this is when they start to lose interest. This is when they're starting to be like, okay, semi listening, maybe not really listening. And then finally, your last 60 seconds. This is where I would say you gotta start to wrap it up. Wrap up what you're saying because again, talking too much is the quickest way to lose your audience's attention. And 
when I say audience, it can be even just the one on one person you're talking to the a, a small team meeting. It's basically just keeping this in mind. Now, of course, this is like 60 seconds and it's super fast, right? So it's not like a hard rule. And I don't want to give the impression that, oh my goodness, your, your message only has to be one minute long. But I do think this is a good reminder for all of us to think about making our communications as relevant and as succinct as possible. Because to me, that really is the marker of a good communicator, somebody who can be very succinct in their communications. Okay. So just kind of keep this in mind as you're, as we go through this formula. All right. So let's start with the teaser. Remember the teaser, it's those first few words, that first few sentences that you say. So when you think about your teaser, your priority is to attract and gain the attention of the people you're talking to. And this is where I talked about leveraging emotions. So here are some examples of how you can do it. And it's actually as simple as this. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. What a great opportunity for us to be at this event together. Oh, I saw you were connected to A, B, and C person. This is what I mean. It's nothing that's super complicated, but the words excited, great, connected. These are words that in our world, in the communications world, they're emotional words and they trigger something in other people where they're like, oh, excited, great, connected. It makes me want to like know more. So I would say anytime you're meeting someone for the first time or you're walking into a meeting for the first time, start off your talk thinking about how you can say things like this, because the idea is you want to start off positive and really you want to have that speaking energy. How many times have we been in a conversation where we're meeting someone for the first time and maybe just their talking is very monotoned. I'm not going to talk about it too much today, but I do a whole talk on presentation skills and I talk a lot about tone of voice. And when it comes to tone of voice, your tone of voice is your way to get people to lean in to what you're saying. Imagine if I was chatting with you all today and I was just like this, I would be kind of boring to listen to honestly. So for me, because I'm the one speaking, I'm constantly thinking about tone of voice and energy. This is what you got to think of especially the first few sentences you say, because bringing that positive speaking energy, oh man, if you do it well, people are like, ooh, they're attracted to that. This is what I mean by the teaser. All right, let's talk about headlines. So remember, this is the second part now. You've hooked them in with some sort of emotion to pique their curiosity, to get them to go, oh, right? Now, this is where you drop in that really impressive thing about you. That impressive thing can be maybe your current title, like what it is that you're doing that's relevant to the person you're speaking with. This is maybe something that you're really proud of, an accomplishment that you've had. Or maybe if, let's say you're an attorney or some, or you're doing some big cases, some big projects, this is where you wanna be like talking about it. Because remember how I talked about credibility? This is where you showcase that credibility. This will be uniquely you. So everybody who's here right now, this is going to mean something, right? This headline is going to mean something different for every person here. And it also will be different depending on the context you're in and who you're talking to and what the person cares about. So when you think about your headline, just think about who am I talking to? What do they care about? What can I say? that's relevant to them, that will wow them and impress them. That's your headline. One of the coolest things about having a strong headline and impressing others is something called the halo effect. So the halo effect is, it's, it's basically where if you have and you give a positive impression in this one area, that positive impression will also carry over to other things that you're doing and people will see that as also positive. It's 
called the halo effect. And, you know, whether it's like right or wrong, it's just human nature, right? When we think we have a positive perception of something, that generally will carry over and we'll have a positive perception of that thing, even though it might be something different. It's called the halo effect. So why I bring this up is if you can leave that positive impression with somebody with that wow headline, chances are they will remember you in that positive way. So here are just some tactical examples of things you can say. Well, you've hooked them in with your teaser. Now you can say, well, I have been specializing in real estate litigation, for example, or IP protection for X number of years, right? Wow headline. I am actually one of four project manager, project management leads who has X cert certifications, right? Just something like that, where it's unique. It's something that's you. Or you can say, you know what? I grew up doing X, which is how I gravitated towards doing A, B, and C right now. Again, uniquely you, something that will get the other person to be like, hmm, that's pretty memorable. Okay, teaser, headline, body. Your body is now where you then talk about, okay, this is why I mean what I say. This is how I prove that I really do know my stuff. Proving expertise can be something as simple as including data, numbers, to show that, yeah, you really have those facts to back it up. You know, you can also leverage what we call public knowledge. And public knowledge is basically, if you are talking about something that you did that's really amazing, but you feel like they might not actually know about it or they might not have heard about it, you can actually leverage public knowledge cases or stories to make it relevant so they go, oh, okay, I understand what you mean. That's an example. So basically taking stuff that's already in the public domain so they can understand your expertise, especially if your expertise is, let's say, very specific. Another thing about body is this is where you really talk about why this matters and you can leverage current events. So if you talked about how me and my team, we solved A, B, and C problem. If you can talk about why this matters and you can talk about maybe an example of something similar, a current event, right? Similar to public knowledge. That is how they can understand the implications of it. Your body can sound like this. Well, we recently helped our clients win X, right? That's proving your expertise that we really did do something. Or we recently negotiated X, Y, and Z. Again, you're really showing that you know what you're talking about. Or talking about leveraging public knowledge and you know current events. You can even say things like, well, you have you seen maybe a few months ago about X company did this? Well, we are working on something similar, and this is what I mean. Here are examples of how you can talk about your body, your expertise, so that people understand and they can go, oh, I see what you're saying, and I can see you mean what you say. That's what your body is. Finally your takeaway. Your takeaway is basically where you are prioritizing ending and basically concluding your elevator pitch. So you prioritize engagement. Engagement is what we talked about before. You want them to ask you follow-up questions. So how can you think about engagement? This is where you want to solidify what you just said in the beginning. It's a way for you to solidify your capabilities. So you know how you talked about your teaser or your headline in the beginning? How you wrap up your elevator pitch is where you can repeat. Truly, it's as simple as that. Repeating what you said in the very beginning. So it's what we call having that full circle moment, right? So you basically took them on this like really quick journey of who you are, what you do, you proved it. And then you're like, this is why I do this. So they go, oh, I get it. You solidify your capabilities. Another way you can end your elevator pitch is you can actually also ask 
a question. This is where if you are not sure if people are going to ask you a question, you can engage the other side by asking them a question. And that just effectively gets the conversation going. So here are some examples. You can say, you know, given everything that I mentioned about me and my experience, what we can do, right? The emphasis is continuing the conversation. What we can do is A, B, and C. What do you think about it? Or you can say, so I talked about X, Y, and Z. I'm curious, what are you seeing here as well? Or have you had the same kind of experience? Or is this something that resonates with you? These are questions that you can ask other people to gauge how they feel about what you just said. Your takeaway is very important because what you want to prioritize is making sure that conversation doesn't stop. Now, I would say this is especially important if you are maybe meeting a potential client for the first time, right? You want to keep the conversation flowing. You know, they always say that there is this like ratio of talking versus listening. And really, if you are thinking about your elevator pitch and leaving an impression on somebody, you really should only be speaking about like 20% of the time and you should be listening about 80% of the time because based on what people say, you can tailor your message so it resonates with the things they care about. So your elevator pitch is basically your way to kick off the conversation, but that's the thing, it's to kick it off. Engage them enough so that they will want to continue knowing more about you. All right, let's do a quick review of your elevator pitch because I just dropped a whole bunch of tips right now. So your elevator pitch is your teaser and it is where you want to evoke those emotions in people where they will turn around and they will put their phone down and they will listen to you. Your second part is the headline. It's again, where you're establishing your credibility, your experience, who you are, that high level accomplishment that's uniquely you and really providing those like big wow cases or examples. Your body, this is now where we call you're backing it up. You're backing up those like wow statements you made in the beginning with data and numbers, evidence, why it's relevant. Your body is important because for many of us, when we are gauging whether the person knows what they're really talking about, the body is where you show that. And then finally, your takeaway. So your takeaway, again, is where you want to be very strategic on not just ending it, but ending it with a question or ending it in a way that hopefully the other person will be like, tell me more. You want to keep it going. This is your elevator pitch. As you think and as you look at this, I want to just kind of take a moment for you to just internalize this. I know many of you are like, yes, I have an elevator pitch or no, I don't have an elevator pitch, but I want you to see and think about how this can apply to you. The next time you are meeting someone for the first time, a new person, or maybe you are jumping into a meeting with maybe there's some new people. I want you to think about how you can start off your speaking by kicking it off with that emotion, talking about what you know, giving those examples, and then ending it with the question. And remember how I said, it's not about being super long-winded, but it's saying just enough so people go, wow, Jessica, for example, really knows what she's talking about. We need to listen to what she has to say. That is the marker of a great elevator pitch. And you can absolutely take this and apply it. So really an elevator pitch isn't just like only the first time you meet somebody. An elevator pitch is you practicing it with people maybe you already meet and maybe people on your team already. But that's the thing. It's thinking about how you can frame your communications with a little bit more strategy. Because I think sometimes a lot of us, when we speak up in meetings, maybe we just like, I call it, a lot of us just brain dump. We just brain dump everything all at once. 
but we're not making it super relevant to the people who are there. This elevator pitch, and I say elevator pitch very loosely, elevator pitch is how you can do it with a bit of strategy. Okay. At this point, you're like, I get it. I get the elevator pitch, but what about following up? Do I keep talking about my elevator pitch? Do I keep repeating myself? Like, how do I do this? And what does this sound like? So let me ask you all a very quick question. And actually, I want you to open the chat function right now because this will be a fun, quick poll. So here's a question for you and you'll see it here on your screen. And I want you to give me your gut reaction to the answer or to the question. So this is the question. How many times does somebody need to see or hear a message for it to stick? And I'm going to give you three options here. Is it one to four times, five to seven times, or eight to 10 times? Put it into the chat function. I'm seeing all your answers come in right now. We have a variety. Some of you are saying one to four, five to seven, Many of you are saying eight to 10. I love this. And I love seeing the different variety in perspectives of like, what is it that, how many times do, do people really need to hear something? Depends on your audience. Okay. I like that. I like that, Victor. Okay. All right. So given what you all said, which by the way, thank you for writing in your answers. I'm going to share with you what the answer is. How many times does somebody need to generally hear or see a message for that message to really stick? Do you see it? Five to seven times. This isn't me just making it up. There's been tons and tons of research behind this. In fact, in fact, there's actually like an advertising word for this. It's called effective frequency. And it basically, I mean, as you can imagine, people have studied how many times does a consumer, a person need to see something for it to really internalize and stick. It is truly as many as five to seven times. And what I love about this is I hope you find comfort in knowing that Sometimes when you feel, should I bring it up again? Am I being annoying? Is it too much? It's actually not too much because as people, we are distracted by so many things, our phones, our emails, like our family, our friends, like there's just so many other distractions that we can't always remember every single thing a person said, especially at work too, right? So don't feel that following up once twice, three, or even four times is too much. You really have to do it many times. But I get a lot of people are like, uh, but it feels uncomfortable to keep bringing something up when maybe they haven't responded or maybe if they've said no. Okay, this is where I really have to talk about this notion of being proactive. Being a proactive communicator is probably one of the most important skills at work that we're not often taught. Because if you think about the working world, what's the worst thing that can do that we can do? It's catching people off guard or people having to chase us for updates. Imagine if you had to keep emailing somebody, what's the update? What's the update? You wouldn't have a good impression on the other person because you're like, why is this person not keeping me in the loop? How many of us have experienced that? So for you, if you really want to leave a good impression, you have to think about proactively communicating. So this is easy to do when maybe there's good stuff already, right? There's good news. Being proactive when there's good things happening is easy because of course it's good stuff. You can also proactively communicate by saying things like, FYI, you know, have you seen this? I just wanted to let you know, here's a quick update. I'm really excited about this. I want you to proactively find opportunities for you to keep people in the loop. Keeping people in the loop is how you can stay top of mind. You know, talking about elevator pitches, really the essence of you knowing you have a good elevator pitch 
is people remembering what you said. It's people remembering who you are, the work that you do, and why you are incredible. Proactively communicating it is how you can make sure people remember this about you. All right, it's easy to do when it's good stuff happening, right? You have good things to say, you have good things to talk about, you have good things to update people on. But what if, what if it's like not good stuff? What if there's like trouble happening in our projects, things are falling apart? How do you talk about this without, without even, sh without shattering your credibility, right? So when it comes to addressing bad news, we actually say you have to do this. You actually have to double down. You have to double down on your communication skills. The worst thing that we can do at work is if something is not going well, things are falling apart, we hide, right? Or we try to like fix it ourselves. The worst thing you can do is catch people, is, is you surprising other people. It's better that you talk to people about what's going on, looping them into the process of fixing it so they feel like they are a part of it, right? It's, you don't want your manager to be surprised if they're like, wait, what happened? How long ago was this, <laughs> right? So this is where you wanna double down on communicating the process because when you communicate good stuff, and when you communicate bad stuff, you are building visibility for yourself. You're showing that you are a problem solver. You're not hiding behind problems. And most importantly, again, you are keeping yourself top of mind. If there's kind of like a takeaway, it's really a good elevator pitch. Proactively communicating and following up is how you can make sure people remember you especially if you're not in the room. How many times are decisions made when we're also not there? This is where you have to make sure people think about you when there's a good opportunity. Okay, we're about to wrap up here and I shared so many tips, but before we wrap up here with a review, I wanna talk about this one misconception. Do you remember how I talked about elevator pitches and, and creating a positive impression? it actually doesn't happen alone. It happens with other people. So what does this mean? We can also build up somebody's credibility just as much as we can build up other people's credibility. We can work together to build each other's credibility. For example, I talked about how people introduce you, how you introduce others. So how you introduce others, you are also effectively making an elevator pitch for somebody else. So think about if you are a manager and you're bringing somebody on your team into a new client project, for example, how can you introduce this new person so that your potential client can be like, oh, wow, this person who's joining this project, they sound pretty impressive. We can build each other's credibility. You can say things like, you know, Kate here, she is an expert in IP law, for example. You're using the word expert and people are like, oh, I'm listening. Or you can say, if you're bringing in your team, let's say your entire team, and you know they're meeting someone for the first time, you can talk about your team by saying, you know, my team, it consists of people who have a variety of great experiences in X, Y, and Z. Imagine if you introduce your team that way, if you're a manager, for example, whoever you're talking to will be like, oh, wow, we are excited to work with them and they sound like an awesome team. But again, you can also do this. You can also say, this reminds me of Stacy's work. She recently worked on something very similar. So this is an example of, let's say if Stacy is not in, a, in the room, right? And you were all talking about a project and you're like, wait a second, Stacy on my team is pretty awesome and she's doing really great work. I can use this as an opportunity to build up her credibility by highlighting her, saying her name, even though, for example, she's not there and you telling people what she did. So I like to end this talk by sharing things that we can do 
for other people, things we can do for our team, because our elevator pitches, you know, our credibility, these things don't happen alone. Yes, a lot of it is how we talk about ourselves. Remember the TV, the TV formula, but a lot of it is how we also talk about the people we work with. Ultimately though, I think if we talk about our team in a positive way, we talk about the people in our organization in a positive way, it's actually a great win-win. It shows that you built up other people and it shows that you are part of a great team. It shows that you're part of a great organization doing kind of awesome things. So this is what I mean about it not happening alone. And ultimately it really does do this. When you are able to showcase that positivity, it is magnetic. It is something that can build connection. You know, people generally speaking are, are wanting to be around people who are positive, right? You have that like magnetic charismatic speaking and energy. So let me just say, thinking about how you can build up other people, build up people's credibility is a win-win and it helps people want to get to know you. Okay. Let's do a quick review. We talked about so much and I want to make sure we have enough time for some questions, but we talked about the misconceptions. I shared with you how, you know, your elevator pitch is not where you dump all this information. It's not where you are rehashing your resume. It's not you selling any sort of service. It's not something that always just happens alone. I also talked about the power of the pitch. A good pitch is one that can build and foster connection. A good elevator pitch is an opportunity for you to establish your credibility. It's also where people are like, ooh, I wanna know more about Jessica, for example, right? It's where they want to know more about you. I then shared with you this formula of how you wanna communicate with this framework. I called it again, the TV formula, but it's basically having that teaser, headline, the body and takeaway. This is how I want you to frame your communications because this is the most tried and true way of gaining and maintaining somebody's attention so they stay engaged with you the whole time. I then talked about the follow-up and do not feel bad. Do not feel bad needing to follow up with somebody more than once, two, three, four times because yes, it does take many attempts. But the key here is maybe finding a different time, a different environment. If it was in person, maybe do it through an email, maybe frame it a little differently. But the key here is being proactive about it. I hope that as you think about all these things, you will think about what I call your speaking energy as well, and to exude that tone of voice of positivity, because again, that is what people will lean into because generally, again, if you are speaking with that positive speaking energy, you have that warmth, people want to connect with you and people will want to pay attention to what you have to say. Okay, that is it. I hope you all were able to walk away with some, I call it golden nuggets, golden nuggets of how you can think about your elevator pitch and the follow-up, but also, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm really active on LinkedIn and I talk a lot about communication skills and I'm constantly sharing tips on LinkedIn. So that's the QR code. I think you can scan it and it'll take you to my LinkedIn page or just add me Jessica Chen um, on LinkedIn.